behind at this stage, which we have to catch up somehow. The transformation is complete. In just four weeks, the football pitches and tennis courts have been swept away, and in their place, flowers and foliage, pools and lawns, and that special fragrance of an English spring morning. The gates are about to open and let in gardeners from all over the world to savour the delights of the 1992 Chelsea Flower Show. Welcome and over the next hour in glorious weather. And Greg, Nigel Coburn and I will take you around and show you the highlights of the 79th Chelsea Flower Show, I think it is, but your second, Dan. That's right, and I should have lost that wide-eyed wonder by now, but you know, I haven't. I still think it's magic, Alan. So I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going off to buy my catalogue, and I'll see you in an hour. I'll catch up okay. with you then. I'll talk to the expert. <laughs> Nigel, you've been a judge here more often than not, so... How does that affect the way you see the show? Every time I come here, Alan, I'm looking for excellence in the plants, but I want to be excited. I want to find something new, something different, good combinations of plants. But as well as all that, what I really want to do is catch up with all my old mates and find out what's been going on. So I'll see you later. Good morning. I certainly do want one. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Got the right money. Well, old hands may find their way around without any trouble, but um, I certainly need to refer to the catalogue from time to time. Let's find the map. Now, down here, you've got the rock garden bank, which is terribly popular, and then the town gardens and the courtyard gardens with hanging baskets, which really get in a jam up on the main avenue. The eastern avenue is where you buy things like books and prints. Northern Road is the machinery along the top. I'm going there because I've got a problem with my lawnmower. And the Western Avenue has got uh, fixtures and fittings, garden sheds, things like that. And the Marquee, of course, which is where everyone heads first. Chelsea is a place for the biggest and the best. The biggest site in the Marquee is the Monument site, occupied this year by one of the biggest firms, Hilliers, tree and shrub growers. There are plants here that make the likes of me dribble. Here's a plant which could have one of the biggest names at Chelsea. Acer palmatum benishikihengi. Wonderful finely cut foliage of pink and green. But that foliage will drop come autumn. If you want something that's evergreen, that's going to last all the year round, better to look at Grisillinia literalis Dixon's cream. Butter splashed leaves, a really good seaside plant. It's like being dropped into the middle of the perfect springtime garden here. And this is a plant that's a particular favourite of mine because it grows on chalky soil that I've got in my garden. Viburnum plicatum marisei, horizontal branches covered at this time of year with white lace cap flowers. The centrepiece of the exhibit is the tallest tree ever seen in the marquee at Chelsea, a 25 foot English oak. There's a great call for trees like this from landscapers who want instant effect, but one of these will cost them about one and a half thousand pounds. You don't have to spend anything like that on some of the superb flowers all around you in the marquee. Burgeoning begonias, fabulous fuchsias, outrageous orchids, colossal cacti, huge hippiastrums, and tremendous tulips. The biggest building at Chelsea must be this one from Oakleaf Conservatories. It's like a crystal version of St Paul's Cathedral and the dome on top 
is from Broughton Hall near Skipton in Yorkshire. The firm were commissioned to restore it and they thought they'd give it an airing at Chelsea before they took it back. Water. It's in every garden. Rippling, trickling or gurgling. But here it comes crashing from the top of a 27-foot waterfall, the tallest ever built at Chelsea. The Greening of Industry is the title of Paul Cooper's design and it's been built with terrific patience and skill by students from Pershaw College of Horticulture. It shows that nature really is in charge. As soon as man turns his back, the plants are in to colonise. But then, if you've ever weeded a garden, you'll know that. This isn't so much a garden, more a Welsh slate mine with plants native to Wales occupying every crevice and fissure. Among these rocks are plants from Uzbekistan in a garden designed and put together by Ravil Abdullin, the first Russian student at the RHS Gardens in Wisley. This garden has had the biggest problems. Ravil talked his way past the KGB to get to the Russian ambassador in London. Then the Soviet Union was disbanded and Aeroflot planes were grounded. So Ravil personally supervised the arrival of 23 tonnes of granite. Two ornately carved pavilions, specially made by 20 craftsmen, should have arrived weeks ago. They've disappeared between here and Tashkent. So have the men who are going to make the garden. Ravil borrowed labour from other exhibitors. It's that kind of show. And plants have come from Hilliers. Plants that can grow in a climate that freezes hard in winter and bakes to a crisp in summer. It's a tough life in Uzbekistan. Have people been very helpful here with all your problems? Yes, of course. All Britain, I think all Britain to help me. <laughs> Help, give help, a lot of help to me. You'll find the grandest antique statuary here. Even the firm that's selling them is antique. Crowthers have been going since 1880. These are really aristocratic ornaments. You can have a recumbent nymph in a grotto. Cheer up, love. Or a dribbling lion. Or perhaps Cupid and his bow. But grandest of all is the centrepiece that was once outside Newgate Jail that's now the site of the Old Bailey. For this one, you'll need a swift £26,000. And then she is called plenty. Small is beautiful too. This pretty acer called Shishigashira is 15 years old, but it's only 7 inches tall. Bonsai are very beautiful things, and uh, not only are they beautiful, but they uh, represent real trees in miniature, and so you can have large collections of small trees, almost like a medieval forest, in your back garden. And they're not very difficult to keep. And over at the Alpines, they're ambitious again this year. We've been able to colour coordinate, we've been able to make a saxophage mountain if you like, and it's, we're really, very pleased with it ourselves. The Alpine Garden Society is made up of, of, of members who are amateur members, and without them we couldn't do it. I can't pay enough tribute to them. We've been to America and we send tours abroad ourselves. We go rather long distance these days to the Andes, to New Zealand and Nepal, and come back and then look at the slides we've taken. We don't make a policy of collecting plants, and I can't emphasise that strongly enough. Um, but we do occasionally finance formal expeditions which then go and collect seed mostly, um, bring them back and uh, they're then raised by our amateurs. Any hiccups this year? Well we did get our plants caught in a traffic jam and Mary's car broke down and then we sent her off to buy some bark and she came back with some pulverised rubbish and we had to go out and get some more. So, you know, apart from that it's gone fairly smoothly. As usual, Tony Clements has brought along his African violets, both in miniature and medium-sized. They do originate from Africa. In fact, it's exactly a hundred years since Baron von St. Paul brought back the first, and from it, all African violet hybrids have since been bred as houseplants, of course, in this country. So the launch of a new one to celebrate the centenary was a must. It's lovely, but you know, I think my favorite is still Fred. Well, where do I go next in the marquee? Ah, there.
That rhyme comes from Wakefield Prison, where the inmates had to trudge around a mulberry bush in the middle of the exercise yard. And it's a mulberry bush that makes the centrepiece for Lay Hill Prison Garden on the Rock Bank. The theme is prisons through the ages, with pillories overshadowing pre-Victorian plants on that side. And then over here, the sort of thing you might have seen in a Victorian prison garden, 19th century plants, 19th century planting. And so to the present day, with mixed planters and hanging baskets on a fancy wrought iron frame and the sort of rockery you'd find in anybody's front garden today. On a very much larger scale, veteran exhibitor Douglas Knight has lifted something like 40 tonnes of Welsh hillside and brought them here to make a lovely mountain stream. These huge lumps of rock have been arranged so that the contours look like a typical hillside with the stream cutting through with a series of rapids and plants in all the crevices and then ending up with a quiet pool at the bottom. In recent years, Douglas Knight has been the only exhibitor of rock work, but this year rock and mountain streams have made quite a comeback and Tim Newbury has designed for Wyvale a garden with a Scottish theme. But there's more to it than that. On the left-hand side of the stream grow plants which would be happiest in the cool but gentle western climate. Plants like the blue Himalayan poppy and large hybrid rhododendrons. But here, on the other side of the stream, are plants which will put up with the bitter cold winters and rugged climate of eastern Scotland. Bistort, for example, lupins, columbines and cranesbills. And there's a plant here too that was actually raised in Scotland, the lovely hybrid primula in Veru. Well, the best landscaping in the world is absolutely hopeless unless the planting is good. And on the B&Q garden, David Stevens has just about got it right. He's used a very subtle combination of garden plants like hybrid rhododendrons and red leaf maples. He's blended these with natives like ragged robin and wild natives from abroad like Siberian irises. Well, it's rather unnatural to bring all these things together and to use a lot of man-made materials but I'm sure you'll agree the effect here is one of perfect nature. This professionally landscaped garden sets the standard of competition for a garden like this one, designed and built by landscape diploma students from Merriswood College in Surrey. Money may not be in plentiful supply on this garden, but time and effort are being poured in by the barrow load. Back at the college here, a month before the show, the students are making their own mock-up of the garden just to make sure they don't make mistakes when they get there. But then a lot's at stake, not only that gold medal, but also the ongoing reputation of the college. Now, as you know, previous year's students who were sitting where you were last year uh, contributed much to that, and the design that was chosen was one by a student last year called Adam Flett, and his design is here, as you can see, at the moment. It's your jobs now to sort of refine it, if you like, and to then develop the thing. And, of course, the other disadvantage we have at the time is we have to work within a very tight, limited budget. Sometimes we have very little, you know, hundreds of pounds, as against uh, our professional colleagues who have got thousands of pounds often to, to do their gardens. Is sponsorship easy to find? No, not at all. Not this year. The industry's in a bit of a mess this year, I think. Um, I think the college has bailed us out with a few items. Uh, hopefully things will get better. Now, some of the plants you're using look pretty mature. Yes, yes. Some of them date back quite a way, actually. Um, there's a Cornus alba up, up there in a milk crate, which has been uh, going back and forth to Chelsea for quite a few years, and a Cotinus as well. We take a note of everybody's individual skills because everybody's been working in the industry before they came back to college and uh, we try and give them the jobs that they can they can do best obviously we've got to give them the jobs that they can do best so that uh, we get the best result so you sort out your sponsorship you sort out the design then what do you do uh, we start the mock-up basically we uh, work out what materials we're going to need and people go out and start getting them um, and then we start building each individual bit of the garden. How far can you go with your mock-up? As far as possible, really. The chalet that we're building is going to be built almost 
complete, other than the bits that just need tacking on when they go up to Chelsea. So we get an idea of what that looks like. Um, that will be taken apart and rebuilt up on the site. Uh, the plants, we know what we're going to use um, so we can nurture those particular plants. And the stonework, we can obviously build it to a certain extent, but we can't put water in it. We can go so far, but we can't, obviously can't build the entire garden. You're about, say, give or take a few days a month off now. Slightly less than that, it's about three weeks, isn't mm. it? What are your feelings now? Uh, pretty nervous. The exams have become a bit proliferal to me. Um, yeah, it's just nervous. We, do, we don't know what, what we're going to meet yet. We, I, I'm sure there's trepidation amongst all of us, but we'll come through it, I'm sure. <laughs> And come through it they have, that muddy, rocky slope is now a hillside chalet garden with a European flavour. The chalet with its Swiss-style cascade geraniums. You walk down a path of shale past an alpine lawn that's got in it as many daisies as I have in my lawn at home. The stream has got water in it at last and alongside it, classic streamside plants. Things like the bistort that flowers from May to October, but even that's not as long as these lads took to get this garden right. <laughs> How do they feel about it now? Brilliant, well, brilliant. Very relieved. Very relieved. Relieved, yes. Good to get back to lectures again. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Tired, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so if I wanted to buy this garden, how much would you charge me to build it for me? Probably about 15, 17,000 pounds. And have I did it myself? About two to three thousand. I think I'll do it myself. <laughs> but would you get the quality? quality. <laughs> 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 There are even greater smiles from the students of Pershaw College. Their Welsh slate mine has won the Sword of Excellence as best garden in the show. The handiwork of the students has beaten the professionals. Is this the judge's way of throwing down the gauntlet and encouraging more sympathetic planting and daring landscaping? One of a dwindling number of councils here is Birmingham City, and they just happen to be UK City of Music this year. But apart from the music, look at the artistry, the colour scheme for instance. Warm glowing reds going down through oranges, yellows and finally to white. And apart from the artistry, look at the horticulture. There are more than 40,000 plants in this display, and carpet bedding is difficult. These are all growing plants, they're not just broken off and stuck in. And in fact, it's not just going to last for four days. At the end of the show, this whole exhibit will be reassembled back in Birmingham in Centenary Square, and there it'll form the centrepiece for Birmingham's first ever entry into the Britain in Bloom competition. Glasgow. And in ancient Celtic, the word means dear green place. And that's the theme the city's used here. The whole variation on the colour green using foliage and different textures, things like this lovely tree fern. And then the flowers, mainly white with just a touch of pink and cream here and there. And the display topped with arrangements of orchids. Well, that's appropriate because next year Glasgow hosts the International Orchid Conference. And from the other end of Britain, the first really new potatoes of the year are always Jersey Royals. It's the mild climate that enables them to be so early, and they grow a lot of other early vegetables too, like cauliflowers, tomatoes and green beans, and beautiful flowers too. And since it's a mild island, and very beautiful, their other main industry is tourism. So what better for them than to come here, exhibit their wares, and show everybody in mainland Britain what a lovely place Jersey is to visit. For a traveller like me, this would permanently remind me of somewhere in the sun, somewhere in the Mediterranean, perhaps. And isn't that clever? A mirror set into the wall, so you've got another garden through there, or so you think. And we've got trickling water, too. If I suspend belief, I could be in the Alhambra Gardens in Seville. Actually, it's the Sunday Times version of a town garden by Randall Sidley, an idea not hard to copy. The terracotta Roman tiles are in fact made in this country, and the wonderful mosaic paving just needs an awful lot of pebbles and patience, and I suppose a set square. The theme is definitely abroad thoughts from home. 
The town gardens especially appeal to me because I've got a town garden. And what I think is nice is that within quite a limited and enclosed space, the designer can show his or her personality. That's certainly true of this one. It's been created by Rosemary Veery for the Evening Standard, and she's made it rather like a room outside. There are lots of flowers for cutting and plenty to eat too. Herbs and vegetables mixed in the planting, lots of featheriness and things with small leaves. In fact, it's all faintly Beatrix Potterish. I can just see Mrs. Tiggywinkle coming round the corner. Very different this one, the Daily Express garden designed by Jeff and Faith Whiten. It's quite seriously formal, with, as Faith herself says, a yuppie couple in mind. The garden's a sort of extension of the living room, in fact, with a modern feel, and it's a garden, too, that to some extent you can take with you when you move up, because there are heaps of things in pots. By the way, the Whitens also designed the Gardener's World magazine garden. This one looks a little more permanent, complete with boat. The idea of growing edibles along with flowers and plants really seems to be taking on. This garden, designed by Daniel Pearson for the Gardener magazine, does it too. There are raspberry canes and broad beans in the borders. And look here, courgettes growing up the pergola. But the real eye-catcher has to be the wonderful grassy seat. Not, I'm told, covered in couch grass or even couch grass. I asked Daniel if they had a special baby lawnmower to cut it, and they have. They've even sometimes done it with the scissors. There's also a grass-topped wall with grass-topped cannonballs to match. Meanwhile, down at the shed end, shades of Chelsea football, the woods painted a marvellous blue-grey, which is somehow a perfect foil for the garden's colours when you think it might have been a bit depressing. I think, though, above all, this design proves you can use your sense of humour in a garden. It's really witty and original. Well, we're definitely on the right track here. We've moved on to courtyard gardens now, paring down the scale a little. This one comes from Thames Down, or you might know it as Swindon. It's a borough council job, and it's uh, certainly full of new ideas. Is it a struggle to compete against uh, the biggies like the councils who've obviously got a lot more money to spend? We're not actually competing. We're, competing, we're, we're actually competing against the standard. We're not competing one against the other. It's not cutthroat competition. It's not w one gold medal, one silver gilt, one silver, one bronze. I wanted particularly to do a garden with an historic theme so and does that mean that a lot of your plants could have been seen in a 16th century garden? The answer is yes, the genus certainly would have been seen, um, the, of the plants that are in this yeah. garden. Um, my favourites, I think, are probably these lovely old roses. Um, I think it goes very well with this pale pink um, Nemesia denticulata, and I think that makes rather a nice combination. My other great favourite is this Astrantia Hadspin Blood, the actual genus of Astrantia would have been in a garden in the 17th century. The one I like particularly is the edging that you've used along here, which looks a bit like convolvulus, but it can't be a convolvulus, is it? Yes, it is absolutely is a variety really? of convolvulus. If you're setting your sights really high, then look up to the chimney pots on Fison's roof garden. We're not talking balcony here, we're talking penthouse suite. 
just make sure your roof's pretty well reinforced and then you can sit in your conservatory and have a bird's eye view of your garden in the sky. Water bubbles up over a blue ceramic vase and while most of us would paint the woodwork in our gardens white or maybe dark green, the designer of this garden, Gillian Temple, has chosen pale blue. It's a colour that's reflected not only in the water but also in the gravel and the brickwork and in the planting too. This is a garden designed as circles within circles within circles. I never thought I'd see an allotment on a roof garden, but there's one here. Upper crust, of course, stuffed with ornamental cabbages and kale, red-leaved lettuces and strawberries. And in the middle, a bay tree in a pot, surrounded by herbs. There's one particular herb over here, thyme, right by a seat. Now, in the days before deodorants, this is where you'd come to be fragranced. It's a good old English tradition. Italian brains are behind this garden, which is a roof. Elisabetta Bertelli, what made you bring a roof garden, literally, over from Milan? I am an architect, and everything I do is uh, uh, environmental friendly. And uh, everything that I construct is meant for the people that should be as close as possible to nature. So uh, Chelsea is the best show in, in this field, and that's why I'm bringing and I'm proposing this project to to you, to other visitors of Chelsea. Could you really do this on a house roof? Yes, especially you can utilize it for reconstruction, restoration, and of course for new buildings, new constructions. What about the plants themselves? The plants are perennial plants, they are pine plants. Alpine plants. Alpine plants, they're very strong, they don't need to be watered, they don't need maintenance, and they're strong when the wind comes and they're very <laughs> Uh, they very, very, very strong in all conditions of weather. So you want to see English roofs blossoming then? <laughs> in the right season, yes. You know, we wax lyrical every year about the fact that this great marquee is three and a half acres in size, but it doesn't really give you any indication yardstick for yourself, does it? Because what's three and a half acres? So this year we thought we'd walk you through it. Yeah. There's one door and I'm now walking down the avenue. It's like a, a geography lesson, if you like. You, you walk past, hello. <laughs> you walk past Peruvian lilies, the, the flowers, not the girls. <laughs> English strawberries. I've always been tempted here to, um, are we allowed to have um, pick one off? Oh, I shouldn't think so. You shouldn't think so. I not think so. Not even, not even, Friday night, we're back on Friday night. That's all you get. My earliest memories of coming here at six o'clock in the morning to film this programme, because it's the only time you can do it without bodies swarming over everything. It's a place of memories of your previous life as well. Carpet bedding there from Birmingham. We used to do boxes of that in Ilkley Urban District Council Parks Department, but we had about a dozen boxes of that stuff. Wouldn't have gone quite as far as it has then. But it's a time for, for meeting friends and for saying, hello, hello, all right, kind of thing, and for spotting jewel boxes of stands. Paul, how are you? Good morning, good morning. Nice I'm to fine. see you. Thank you. Lovely Alpine. I'll be back later for seeing old nurserymen friends, for catching up with yourself. I am a garden pink, but I'm not on that stand. And I'm very worried because I might have been pushed over the cliff, as it were. As well as seeing people mourning and having flash guns pointed at you, you can also star spot. Now, the time to do that really is on a Monday, press day. But now and again, you see the stars like Nigel Coburn there, who's probably trying to get a plant named after him, only he's on knock cuts and they're very big in rhododendrons, he's unlikely to have a pink. Surprises too. A huge rotting tree stump covered in toadstools. I've never seen anything like that here before. Now, there are ten of these avenues. This has been one of them. I need a cup of tea. Forty years of the Queen's reign is celebrated here on Knockcut Stand with 40 different trees. And there are specimens and species here to suit practically every situation in every garden. For example, the lovely lime green lacy foliage of Robinia pseudoacacia. Or if you wanted something flowering, how about a hawthorn? But try a crimson one. This one is crimson cloud. 
something architectural perhaps, like the weeping form of the purple beech. But you need room for that, it gets quite big. If your garden's restricted, you could go for Laburnum vossii. Now this one has all the qualities of an ordinary Laburnum, but it doesn't weep seedlings all over the place. One of the lovely things about Chelsea is that everything comes together. What have we got here? Camellias, they flower in late winter. Magnolias, just coming into flower now. Rhododendrons, you associate those with late spring going into summer. They've even got roses in flower on this stand. How do they do that? And look at these cherries. Trees like these would have been in flower in my garden at home, what, five, six weeks ago? Well, here at the nursery on a cold, blustery April day, the cherries are looking more or less like this. Lovely now, but in a little while they'll be over and gone. They've got all the facilities they need here to compress that nine months of growth into four days of perfection for Chelsea. But technology on its own isn't really enough. What you need is a bit of know-how, a bit of savvy. Well, Robert Grimsey and Fred Nichols have been preparing plants for showing here for years. Well, I've been on the shows now about, it's either 26 or 27 years, I can't remember exactly, but in that region. Anyway. What about Robert? Comparative newcomer, been with Fred full time for about five years now. Well, I was doing odd bits before that. So you're pretty experienced, but do you always get it right? I always say we get it right all the while now. It's, you never get two seasons alike, weather-wise, and you get geared up for a hot year or... And when you get a cold time, it throws you out altogether. It's moving, juggling things in and out coal stores, in and out greenhouse to try and time them right. First of all, we start off just after Christmas by putting trees in the dormant stage into a coal store to hold dormant until a few weeks before the show and bring some out, say, four weeks, three weeks, two weeks before the show and try and let them grow natural. For instance, flowering cherries work quite well at the coal store. When you get the crab apple family, I don't, not quite so. So happy they, they deteriorate quicker. So, Robert, how, how do you manage to get it right? Well, it's very much judgment, but we do keep a book here, this particular one, going back to 1968 with notes of what happens. I should imagine we use about a third of what we prepare for Chelsea. A third? About a third, yes, roughly about a third. You see, you, you lose some too soon, come on too soon, and then you've got some which just right, then some which are not forward enough, and therefore they come on for another show. Okay, so we've looked at things that you held back, we've looked at things that are going to be absolutely right next month in the middle of May. How do you sort of drag things forward and make them, make them perform early? Well, uh, we have to put them in heat sometimes, to, uh, in the green oaks in the heat, just to get the, try and push them out. This Rabinia here looks the way it does at home in about, uh, five weeks time that's right so yes, yeah. that's how when did that come into the greenhouse it's been in the greenish now about four weeks the so the these are climbing roses obviously these, this one is one the rambler rose one the old mm. the old the alberic barbia which is oh, going to yeah. come out with a creamy kind of flower mm. and that's in fairly tight bud now but yes, uh, yes, well, well presumably it. that that will be over by chelsea won't it those buds well it will probably have to grow it here in a, in a cooler area just to hold it back so the last few days so and, and you so you 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 make the decision almost on a day to day basis. We do, do you? yes. We look through each day and see which are moving uh, too quick. Then you have to take action and uh, put them in a cool area. Yeah. So you're, you're sort of playing musical plants, oh, really, right, aren't you? Yes, yes, yeah. They, they, they uh, in and out of the greenhouse or in and out of the shade area. <laughs> is it all cleverness and skill, or is there a bit of good luck involved here? Well, there's a lot of luck involved. Yes, I yes, would yes, second that yes. certainly. Mm. You know, ch things can change so rapidly over the space. You can come in on a Saturday morning and water and think everything looks behind. Have a mild night the Saturday night, the Sunday morning you'll be sort of hauling everything out. It changes overnight. Mm. So you tend to sleep a bit lightly between now and next month? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Particularly yeah. if the weather is changeable, Always. yes. Yes, we have a lot of anxious moments. In the 18th century, a certain Lady Hardwick hired a famous landscaper, Humphrey Repton, to redesign her garden at Wimpole Hall near Cambridge. And today the actress, Jerry Hall, has dressed up for the part in aid of the National Trust. 
I think the National Trust is a wonderful organization and I love to see the stately homes and to see the beautiful gardens restored to their former glory. Most of the celebrities at the show this year are here, like Jerry Hall, to promote their favorite charities. Oh, delighted to be launching this, the champagne... Martin Lewis is helping to raise funds for cancer and leukaemia in childhood by launching a new Rearsby rose called Goldfinger. £1.50 of every rose sold for the next 20 years is going to go to provide free accommodation for youngsters all over the country who need specialist cancer treatment and want to be with their families at the same time. S and N Brackley are naming a new scented Spencer sweet pea after Elaine Page. Part of the proceeds will go to Tadworth Court Children's Trust, which is the charity that I support, so I'm thrilled about that. And Julie Andrews has flown over especially to launch a new Friars Rose named after her. Every rose bush that is sold, uh, a pound from the proceeds goes towards the fund to fight arterial disease. This is quite a, quite a special moment for me. Special gardens have, as usual, been designed for some of the big charities, like Help the Aged. Having won gold awards for this charity in two previous years, designer Robin Williams is hoping for success again. And this uh, year you've actually called um, the garden a place in the sun. And there he is, there's well, the sun. Our metal sculpture by Guy Harnden. Yes, it's lovely that. Yes. I like it very much. You've gone for really bright colours this time and in other years they've been a bit more subdued. Well, that's right, Annie, uh, but these wonderful hot glowing colours respond so well to this glorious sunshine we're enjoying at the moment. They certainly do and I think uh, this is my favourite bed of all. I love the combination of pinks and salmon pinks and that wonderful bright orange. This is the Discovery Garden designed for Action for the Blind by Alan Sargent. Not only does it draw attention to the charity and visually impaired people, it's also planned to appeal specially to them. Because it excites all five senses. There are glorious smells, of course, as you walk around, both from the flowers and from the leaves. There are herbs to taste. And over here, some really bright splashes of colour to appeal to people who are partially sighted. There's touch, lovely textures like the rocks to feel, and there's the sound of running water. Also, there are several things in the garden that are actually made by blind people, like the guide rail, which has little studs on it, which you can feel, and that tells you which part of the garden you're in. This, this again is the strong colours. Princess Alexandra is the royal patron of Action for the Blind, and she visited the garden earlier this week. She's also, by the way, president of Alexandra Rose Day, and this year David Austin has named a new rose to benefit her royal ancestors' charity. On Monday, other members of the royal family also came to look at exhibits of special interest to them. The Queen visited the garden designed for the Army Benevolent Fund, of which she's the patron. It's been designed by Guy Farthing in a way to symbolise the work of the Army Benevolent Fund. The fountain is the source of the funds which flows down to former soldiers and their families in need. The stream leads ultimately to a pavilion of rest. This is the first time the Queen and Prince Philip have come to the show for the evening gala because this is the first year that the Army Benevolent Fund has been the beneficiary and co-host with the RHS. Well, it's all in aid of a good cause, isn't it? Mm, there are some delicious exhibits here too. This strawberry is particularly nice. It's an old variety called late pine. And back in the 1950s, it nearly went out of cultivation. The plants were disease-ridden and weakened, but now Ken Muir has had the stock cleaned up so that it's virus-free and available for amateur gardeners to grow. And where did Ken find those last few plants? At the RHS garden at Wisley. Well, the strawberries on the Wisley stand are part of a demonstration showing just how much fruit you can produce in a restricted space. There are cordon trees here as well. They're grown this way to restrict the sap and that stimulates fruit production. 
Or alternatively, you could try growing espalier apples. Very decorative and very productive as well. If you're really limited on space, you could also grow one of the dwarf varieties. Now that one you could even grow in a pot on the patio. And how about this for an idea? You've got to train your loganberries and your taberries somewhere, so why not combine beauty with utility and grow them over an attractive arch like this? You wouldn't normally associate mushrooms with beauty. After all, they grow in the gloom on horse manure. But just have a look at these. These are grown by Wentworth. They're mushrooms which grow naturally on decaying wood and as well as coming in an amazing array of different colours, yellows, pinks and greys, they also come in an array of different flavours and textures. Mmm, certainly different. Britain's commercial growers are represented here by the National Farmers Union. But in a departure from their usual exhibit, which just features produce, this time they've got a display which is designed to encourage people to get out into the countryside and have a look at what Britain's farmers are getting up to. And there's a strong emphasis on the environment here too. This moss frog is supposed to encourage gardeners to have frogs in their pond to eat slugs rather than chuck slug pellets about. And there's also a model of aphidolites, which is a typical example of biological pest control. If you want to see a traditional display of vegetables, then Sutton's have delivered the goods with a marvellous collection of tomatoes, cauliflowers, cabbages, the sort of things you might expect to find at a late summer show. And in fact, it is an achievement getting it all ready this early. These squashes, for example, had to be raised in New Zealand so they were ready at exactly the right time. And then to set the whole thing off, colourful flowers like mixed petunias. Among the professionals, the amateurs, the flower arrangers who make sure that the gardener does not have to live on potatoes alone. The northwest region of the National Association of Flower Arrangement Societies, NAFAS to you, take their turn in the marquee. They've produced the secret kingdom which evokes the spirit of an eastern garden. They've spent between 750 and 1,000 hours adjusting their driftwood, mounting their moss and constructing their cranes entirely out of dried grasses. And if you think that it's just the dexterous digits of ladies that can do this, I have to tell you that the team here consists of four women and five men. This is often the only flower arrangement that visitors see, but if you walk across the showground, you'll come to a small marquee which is positively bulging with their handiwork. Now, I'm all right at bunches, but my flower arrangements never turn out like these.
DLC is not just about things you grow, it's about things you have built. And there's a huge range of structures here on Northern Avenue, from a garden cloche to a full-blown Victorian conservatory. How about this, for instance? It's made of the very latest modern materials, but it's built in the nice old-fashioned style of a kitchen garden greenhouse. Or a smart wooden one. Or the simple aluminium frame like my mum's got. Or the smallest of all, a mini revolving greenhouse. Good, isn't it? You could put it in your backyard. Now that I like, but I don't think it would fit in my garden. Obviously, there are sheds. Now, a shed is a shed is a shed, but I'd describe this as a rather elegant lean-to. Then there are the conservative conservatories, and there are others that go right over the top, and you'd need a second mortgage to buy all of them. Now, on the other side of Northern Avenue is the machinery. Whether you've got a postage stamp or a football pitch, you'll find all the gadgets and gear and the advice to go with it over there. Now, lawn mowers. Well, you couldn't go home from here on a ride on mower, and you certainly couldn't tuck a conservatory under your arm. But the thing about Eastern Avenue is that everything here is pick upable and take awayable, from a whole range of watering cans in all shapes and sizes, or if you want to measure your temperature, you could buy one of these thermometers. There must be one for almost every need here. You could drive your neighbours mad with one of these wind chimes. Or, alternatively, you could just pick up a magazine and read all about it. There we are. Two pounds of happiness people are giving me. There we are, madam. Two pounds only. Possibly the best two pounds you will spend today. I, listen, madam, every time I put your money in the till, there is happiness. <laughs> Have you got my spade, Brian? Yes, Nigel. Great. There we are. Lovely. All done and paid for? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. Right, Cheerio, then. Bye. Mm. You can walk for miles here, but then there's a lot to see. I mean, there are 700 exhibits, which over the week will be seen by 180,000 visitors who eat 90,000 ice cream, 60,000 sandwiches, and 30,000 Danish pastries washed down with a quarter of a million cups of tea, or in this weather, half a million cups of tea. 18 men took 10 days to put up what is described as the biggest marquee in the world in regular use. There are eight miles of water pipe, five miles of cable. It takes 100 police to keep the traffic moving outside and 86 security guards to keep everything secure inside. There are 22 St John's Ambulance volunteers treating during the day 100 faints and 100 blistered pairs of feet. Where are they? This show must be a real headache as far as logistics are concerned. Chelsea is always a headache but it's like trying to fit a quarter into a pint pot. We always pull it out in the end. What's the most important thing from your point of view about managing a show like this? Absolutely to achieve high standards of quality. Our role is to inform, to educate and to instruct people. Uh, we have a clear remit to promote an interest in horticulture and Chelsea is all about new ideas and inspiration. When does the planning start for a Chelsea Flower Show? The planning for next year's show has already begun. It takes a little over a year every year to put the show together. What for you is the nightmare scenario at Chelsea? Well, Chelsea is a very fragile infrastructure. We've got to squeeze a lot of exhibits, a lot of people, and something like 9,000 vehicles in and out of this tiny site. There are several nightmares that could happen. We had, a couple of years ago, we nearly ran out of water when the Water Authority's reservoir ran dry. No water in a flower show would be a nightmare. Chelsea is just one of a series of monthly RHS shows. The rest are held here in the horticultural halls in Westminster, just round the corner from the Houses of Parliament. This is the April show. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. The doors have just opened and already it's swarming with people. There are all kinds of nurserymen here, from tiny little one-man bands to huge great companies, all competing for the same awards of excellence. 
you'll find plants here you'll just never see in your local garden centre. This is a training ground, if you like. Exhibitors come here and work their apprenticeship over several years and then they might, just might, be invited to exhibit at Chelsea. That's happened this year to Derek and Pamela Salt. How are you feeling right now? You've got a month to go. Um, no problem, Mum. We're just quite mad, you know. <laughs> Doesn't the prospect of it terrify you? Yes. <laughs> this is still doing. <laughs> Why? Why do you now want to go for Chelsea? Well, shall we say that I've had an ambition to do it for at least ten years. And we're going to do it. So how many shows have you done here before you're going to go and do this big one at Chelsea? Twenty. <clears throat> we started as amateurs in 1986, while we worked for a certain company. So you reckon you've done your apprenticeship now, then? We're getting the hang of it, you know. <laughs> They've made it. Pam and Derek Salt hold the national collection of double auriculars and they're represented on the stand with these new varieties named last night after their local villages. And right next door to them, some smashing Primula Siboldii. This one's called Joan Jervis after the first customer they ever had at their nursery. It's a Japanese woodlander, happy in dappled shade and a leafy soil. You won't see it at the beginning of April, but by the end of the month it shoots up flowers profusely and is gone by August. But when it's out, what a picture. Are the exhibitors happy? The organisation's been fantastic, it's incredible. Yeah, we didn't have to wait to get in. Everything seemed very well organised. We just came in and got on with putting up the display. And we didn't shout at each other once. Exotics, by definition, should come from somewhere exotic. The trouble is that so many of the tropical areas of the world where they're grown are at the moment experiencing a climatic catastrophe. All over southern Africa there is drought and we know that people are suffering in the most appalling way. That's why these flowers and plants from Zimbabwe are of such vital importance. They mean food because it's only by selling these flowers in Europe that they'll be able to start a business that will ultimately earn foreign currency and feed the people. And here are Cecily and Arthur from Zim Trade. What are you trying to do at the show? We decided to bring these flowers to the show to show you all what can survive in a drought. We're going through a devastating drought and these unknown to us, have survived most beautifully. We didn't realise how well they would do. These are actually all cut flowers here on the stand. But Arthur, yes. I've, I believe you've been digging up bits of Africa to bring us as well. Yes, we brought with us lots of indigenous plants with us, but they are only a glimpse of the whole flo flora you can find in right. Zimbabwe. Which are the indigenous <coughs> ones? Well, in, for instance, this aloe here, grows very well at Inyanga, surrounding what, what is commonly called slave pit, but actually they are livestock pits. Right, but yeah. these, of course, the, the very exotic ones mm -hmm. you're going to sell in this country. And I believe, in fact, um, Cicely, they, they survive very well as cut flowers. They last for a long, long time, so they're the flower ranger's dream. As fresh flowers, the ones we brought a couple of years ago lasted for six weeks. That's pretty good. Yes, pretty and then good. after that, forever, if you can stand looking at them, yeah. they dry very well. Well, these may technically be exotics, but as far as I'm concerned, the whole of the marquee is exotic.
Well, there we are, vintage Chelsea and vintage weather too, and a host of memories to take away. I think the one that I'll always remember is talking to Ravil Abdullin, the lad from Uzbekistan who came over here as a student and wanted to build his own garden. He said, I was in Russia for 35 years, I've been over here for 15 months, and in that time I've made more friends than I ever made back home. What's yours, Anne? Well, that's a lovely story, isn't it? Um, I think what struck me this year was that some of the gardens were really witty, without spoiling the effect. There was that lovely grassy seat in the Gardener magazine garden, and there was the old steam engine in one of the courtyard gardens. Sometimes people try to use humour in a garden, it doesn't work, it goes over the top, but they didn't, it was smushing. Now Nigel, you said you were going to go and catch up with your old mates and find some good plank combinations, so did you? managed to succeed in both and on one particular exhibit my old friend John Metcalf, Four Seasons Nursery, he set up a glorious stand of perennials, beautiful colours, lovely plants and at last he's managed to get himself a gold medal and I'm really delighted that he's finally made it. It's been a good Chelsea, if you've not managed to get a ticket to come and see it I'm afraid then you've missed out because all the tickets have gone and they're not on sale at the gate but don't worry you can see more highlights in Gardener's World on Friday night and in another programme from us on Saturday. And if you have missed this show altogether, don't worry. We'll just say to you what we say every year. See you next year at Chelsea. Bye-bye. Prepare for the bright lights of summer with the new BBC Gardener's World magazine. Discover the charm of Victorian rose growing and see the best in Britain for half price. Get to know your allies in the aphid war and find out how to improve safety in the garden. There's a progress report on BBC One's box hedging and we meet the inspiration behind our very own Chelsea garden. With colourful ways to extend your garden over the house and a chance to win some elegant seating, the new BBC Gardener's World magazine keeps you in the pink.